Let's start with some of the research that wasn't done that, you know, you would you would argue is you know obvious that should be done where it, i mean there's also research that was done that was ignored that's just kind of the second piece we talked we already talked a little bit about that but, but let's start with what research wasn't done here that that really is stark so one thing that wasn't done uh, as soon as the pandemic started we didn't do the studies needed to find treatments so there are a lot of drugs that are existing drugs that might be used for other viruses or other things. And many of them are generic. And we didn't do the solid randomized trials to determine, quickly determine if these work for COVID or not. There were a bunch of smaller studies, but that was the job of NIH, the National Institute of Health, and specifically the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of NIH, uh, they didn't do those studies, and they should have. They should have done those studies for at least a dozen different existing drugs to find out within a few months, do they work or not for COVID. So there was one good study that was done for a drug, and that was from Remdesivir. And the reason is that that's proprietary. So the company who owned Remdesivir decided it was worth all the money, because it's expensive to do these randomized control trials, they decided it was worth doing that because if it, if it uh, was able to treat COVID, they will make a lot of money from this drug. And in the end, it sh they did a very solid study showing that it doesn't really work very well. Uh, it was still approved by FDA for some reason, but it doesn't work very well. But that was the only drug for which there was a very solid, good study. And they should have done that for many other drugs, and more, probably most of them would have found out that maybe it didn't work either. But uh, that should have been done to find out if there was one or two or three drugs that did work. And then we wouldn't have all these uh, disagreements about various treatments, whether they work or not. Because if there had been one large, solid, randomized trial, we would have known one way or the other and we wouldn't have to have to squabble, squarrel, uh, quarrel about uh, whether a particular drug works or not. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash freetrialian. That's ept.ms slash free trial J-A-N. On this point a little bit, I understand there's like, there are a suite of drugs which at the moment have shown promise, most of which are these, you know, repurposed, repurposed drugs, yeah. like one that just comes to mind. Because I remember there was a smaller, maybe not the size of RCT, but like fluvoxamine, it was an antidepressant, I think, right, Is, uh, was, was found to be effective in, a, in some kind of an RCT. But that wasn't adopted very quickly as a kind of, hey, everybody, this is what we can use now, or type setup, right? Yeah, and I think if there had been large randomized control trials, we would, it would have been giving a very clear answer, and there would be more of a consensus of what drugs work or does not work. And the person who should have, who should have initiated these studies immediately, as soon as the pandemic started, was the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, as well as the director of NIH, uh, Francis Collins. So there was their responsibility to do that, to make sure that we found that knowledge. Uh, now, there were other things that we didn't study. For example, there were done small seroprevalence studies. So this, this is to find out how many people have already had the disease by checking if they have antibodies. Uh, for example, there was a very good study done uh, in the spring of 2020 in Spain where they randomly selected 60,000 people of different ages. There were smaller studies done in other countries like Sweden or Iran or, or, uh, or Japan and so on. There was one important one done uh, in Santa Clara by uh, uh, Jay Bharacharya and, uh, and, and others, uh, which was, uh, I think, the, the most important one in the U.S. But this, this was sort of a small study in one county, and what should have been done was to do continuous surveillance with randomly selecting people across the country at different times, in different states, uh, different cities, uh, different age groups, so to constantly monitor 
what the level of antibodies is. And, uh, uh, but that's not the responsibility of, of NIH because that's more of a public health issue. So that's the responsibility of CDC and they didn't do that. So that kind of research question should CDC should have done. And they have plenty of money, a huge budget, a lot of uh, staff. So they, that should have been sort of one of the, the priorities for CDC during a pandemic and they didn't do it. It almost, you know, just as I'm hearing you now, I'm thinking to myself, there's a kind of a chain here, right? If the natural immunity is not supposed to be important, then doing the natural studies about how much natural immunity there is in the population might also not be important. So these things aren't isolated, what these different agencies did or didn't do. Yeah, and I don't know what they were thinking. Maybe that's how they were thinking. Uh, I know in other countries, they did do some of these zero prevalence studies. It strikes me that this model that Sunetra Gupta called, you know, cartel model of uh, uh, doing science, um, it's susceptible to, you know, I think you said this earlier, groupthink, right? So if, 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 a, if the group responsible for one area suddenly all believe a certain thing very strongly, for whatever reason, then the system breaks down. I'm guessing that the corrections you see need to be made to the system somehow help deal with that. Yes, I think the key thing is to do decentralization so that you don't have these sort of power hubs. So for example, in terms of the funding of science, we have Dr. Fauci who sort of sits on the biggest chunk of infectious disease research money in the world. So it takes a little bit of a guts to uh, contradict his view on the pandemic strategy because you might lose resource funding which you need to support your family and support other members of your lab or your resource group who depend on these resource funds. So they should, uh, so that was sort of a conflict of interest where the person who, handings, who is handing out the research funds is also sort of the architects of the strategy because then other scientists will not dare to, to question that strategy. So what should have happened is that it's, there really is a difference because NIH is the research arm of the federal government. So they should have focused on uh, do, making sure all the research was done that was needed to deal with the pandemic. But in terms of what public health strategy to use, that's not the role of NIH. That's the role of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So that should have been separated, and which it wasn't because sort of Anthony Fauci stepped in and did uh, the job of CDC, which was not his job. And to be honest, as a virologist and immunologist, he doesn't have the public health expertise to deal with those things. But he didn't do his own job, which was to fund the studies to find out what treatments work or do not work for, uh, for COVID. So I think we, uh, it's uh, destructive to have all infectious disease research centralized in one institute like that. And of course, there are some other uh, research sources of research money. One is the Gates Foundation, and another one is uh, the Wellcome Trust in the UK. But they were all on the same page with Fauci and Jeremy Farrar, who has the Wellcome Trust in the UK. So they were all sort of talking, and Jeremy Farrar, who is the head of Wellcome Trust, he was uh, one of the lead advisors to the UK government and one of the lead proponents for the lockdowns there. Uh, and I know the Gates Foundation was promoting the lockdowns. So then those who have connections between themselves and controlling the money, it was, became very difficult for, for other scientists to sort of oppose their strategy. At the same time, that there are such, uh, who, some studies sort of jumped on the bandwagon and wanted to sort of help support Fauci and Farrar and so on, uh, because that might be good for their careers to do so.